What is up, everybody? Will Vance here, managing editor at Magnetic Magazine and the host of the podcast you're listening to right now, Magnetic Meaning. We are back with Jim Ryder. Jim has released on Lee Burge's All Day I Dreams label, Tribes of, Tail and Tone, as well as Nick Warren's Soundgarden, and tons more. He's also thrown a bunch of parties in London, and he's also heading off to Ibiza this summer, this season, uh, for the All Day I Dream residency gig. Jim, did I miss any any of your accolades? Is there anything you want to touch on? Uh so people know exactly who we're talking to today. Oh, I think I think you covered it. Um, so how's it going, man? What's what's on the agenda for this week, uh, this weekend, and all of the above? Yeah, a bit of a chill week this week. Um, uh, I'm playing football tomorrow for the first time in a long time. So yeah, it's all eleven aside, football or soccer to you. So I don't know, don't know how that'll go. But um, then I've got a friend's birthday in the evening. But that's it, really. A bit of a bit of a relaxed weekend. Did you play football growing up? Yeah, yeah, quite a lot. Is it like riding a bike? Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure the, the running part is a little bit more to uh, get, to keep up with. Um, but yeah, kind of let's jump into the chat, right? Because we got a, kind of a lot to cover. And I always like to start kind of hopping into the very beginning of, of your journey, right? How did you get involved uh, in the electronic music scene, the music scene overall uh, in London, where you kind of grew up or kind of, kind of cut your teeth? Yeah, so um, my first job in music in London was on a festival called the Southwest Four, run by a company called Lock and Load Events, and I guess I was a, a marketing intern there. So it was an unpaid thing. I was living above a pub in Angel and Islington and doing that during the day and then doing shifts in the pub sort of in the evening and, and weekends. And that was just kind of an intro to, to the world, really, um, just doing sort of helping out with marketing and getting in touch with agents for sort of, I don't know, artists, pictures and all that kind of stuff, you know, the drill. Um, so I did that for about eight or nine months and I ended up going to a place called Proud 2, which used to be called Matter. It was uh, created by the guys at Fabric, so it was over at the O2 Arena in London. Uh, and that got shut down about three months after I was there, so that didn't last very long. Um, and then I ended up from there going to a place called Fire and Lightbox, which is, um, it was a big gay club in London for sort of 20 odd years and they wanted to bring someone into program some straight events and build a team. Um, so I was part of that, and we did a thing called Fire in Session, which is kind of our first big Here We Are, This Is Us series of shows. So we had stuff like Mix Mag and Dirty Bird and Martinez Brothers and you name it, we had it, uh, Music On and stuff like that. Uh, so I was there for about sort of, maybe four years, four or five years, and that was where I sort of went from sort of marketing assistant to marketing manager, if you like. Um, started doing my own sort of uh, curated shows there called Shush, where we did the first ever and Junior Deep parties. Um, and we had a thing called Dawn, which is an after hours. It started at four on a Sunday morning and went on to about midday. We used to run that with uh, Michael Beebe. He used to do the booking for it. And we sort of helped out with marketing. And then sort of later on, we did a thing called Tribal Sessions, which is a big sort of uh, UK rave uh, that's been going on so sort of, I think we brought it back from shows around 30 years ago and it keeps popping up and sort of going going away again so yeah lots of big artists with that people like Booker Shade and Todd Terry and stuff like that so yeah that's kind of how I got into into London into the industry and uh I would like to talk about like the the very the formative years right the earlier years when you were doing those internships and those marketing marketing internships and a lot of that work was unpaid right and I know it's like, you know, it's kind of a hot button issue right now about unpaid internships and stuff like that. And they're always billed as, you know, you're, you learn from experience and you pick up all these like golden nuggets of wisdom and you meet the right people and everything like that. Right. What were some of the biggest like aha moments, golden nuggets of wisdom or anything like that you learned during those very kind of early, early stages of your career because of the opportunities that you took? Um, yeah, I guess it was at a time when the unpaid stuff was the norm. That's only kind of fairly recently where people have gone, hang on, this isn't quite right. And I was in a lucky sort of position where I was living in the pub and doing those shifts and that kind of paid for paid for the day job, basically. Um, aha moment, I guess it was getting to understand the in, inner workings of like how shows are put on from both production sides and from booking the artists, that kind of stuff. Um, I guess working with agents and, and management and sort of getting a handle on that side of it. So yeah, I guess it was just a basic grounding that it was um, that was helpful with. Uh, and is there because I I think there's also this kind of this mystique about what goes on in the music industry, right? Especially for people who are either on the outside looking in or looking to put their foot in the door or anything uh, like that. 
Uh, what what do you think the hardest parts and what do you think the most rewarding parts are about working in the music industry from such a industry side of things, right? Dealing with managers, dealing with bookings, you know, the financial side is is much more of the business half of things. And most people looking to get their foot in the door only think of the creative side of things, right? So so what do you think? I think, I mean, yeah, it's, it's a high stress job, but the, I mean, most most people are in it for the right reasons and in it for the love of music. So when you You've spent months and months, especially when you yourself as forward, an example, you spent a whole year planning an event. To see all that come off in one day makes it all makes it all worthwhile. Uh and so how long were you throwing your own events in London uh before you kind of took yourself on the road, so to say, right? Like, you know, because I'm sure that took a lot of your bandwidth and a lot of your daytime throwing not only one party, but like a whole different, a couple different brands. Right. And, and working at the internships and stuff like that. But now you're a touring, you're a touring, touring guy, touring the whole world. Uh, how'd you make that transition? Uh, and what was that process like? Um, transition sort of actually came after I, I kind of finished working in the industry and went into sort of straight up advertising kind of, kind of stuff instead. So it's still musical based, but it wasn't like putting events on. Um, and then sort of as, as I gradually started releasing more stuff and bigger labels, gigs came in. But it was, I guess it was the start of last year. Um, well, no, start, slightly before, sorry, where um, I was freelancing for a big ad agency, working on like clients like Google and Saint, which is a big supermarket over here. And I was freelancing. I went on a holiday in Mexico, and that coincided when the Order Green EP came out. Um, and that started doing well, and I got some good gigs while I was over there and a bit of interest in the US and stuff like that. So I never ended up going back to work. So it was kind of a natural progression, I guess. Okay. And um, how how important and how formative to your career was throwing your own parties and stuff? I feel like a lot of the times it's it, there's like, you know, it, it's a big jump for someone with no connections or only a few connections or only a, a handful of bucks in their pocket to start booking DJs or start throwing their own party in their city or whatever like that. But I really feel like it's kind of the secret sauce on uh, getting your foot in the door or having some sort of like leverage uh, when you're not some industry heavyweight already. Right. So can you talk about that a bit? I was in a fortunate position where I was working for venues. So, I mean, I guess putting any show on is, is a gamble, right? So I was in a fortunate position where it wasn't my money. So luckily got to put on these, these big shows and, the majority of them came off, some of them didn't, but um, yeah, as you say, booking sort of your favorite artists and some of the biggest names in the world and then getting to hang out with them and, you know, chat to them, get experience from them is, I was very fortunate to be in that position at that time. Uh, and you had mentioned earlier that you were one of the first uh, like promoters or parties to book like the Anjuna Deep sound or whatever. Um, roughly what year was that? Because like they've had an exponential growth, right? So uh, over the past five years or six years or even. So where in that timeline did you start throwing shows? And then how did you first hear about them and like know that they were something special to to get to be an early adopter of the sound? Yeah, so we I think it was probably around 20... 12 2013 or something like that maybe a little bit after that um charlie who was a good friend of mine who i worked with at proud Two, um had a relationship with him already through he used to be a trans dj so he, he had the andrew beats um sort of relationship there and uh, yeah we put the first the first ever shows they did for what well, in london i mean i'm not sure about anywhere else but in london especially they uh they did um and some of those first gigs we were selling out before we didn't put the line apart so that kind of thing and eventually they, they sort of outgrew us and ended up going to xoyo and fabrics and now they're print works and all over the world but i'd like to think that we were a, a, a key part in that growth uh and how how did you first uh like kind of hear hear about them or whatever and then also like be willing to kind of Take take a gamble on on booking them, or was it not that much of a gamble because they are already selling out uh, before yeah. the lineup was even re released? Right? It wasn't it wasn't an, an awful lot of gamble? I mean, they've got a huge fan base already from from Anjuna Beats, um, and diehard fans already with Anjuna deep at that point. So yeah, it wasn't really much of a gamble. Yeah, I guess what the reason why I'm asking that question, right, is that like you know 
the, the best thing to make anything happen in, in music is kind of being the, the first to market or being like a trendsetter or being an early adopter or whatever. Right. Uh, and it sounds like you kind of hit the nail on the head by booking them. Not that like you're, you're releasing on Anjuna or anything like that. Right. But like you were one of the one, the pioneers who helped facilitate their sound in such a big city. Uh, do you have any tips or do you have any insights on like how to keep your ear to the ground uh, so that you can be first to market or like, you know, adopt a new sound or find fresh influences or that kind of stuff yeah i mean at that point i was i was just starting to, to dj and produce in a duo um and we were on eating messy so they were always a good um i don't even remember them but they were always a good um barometer sort of up and coming talent and stuff i mean i did book a lot of people that ended up doing a lot better after we booked them so we maybe got them a little bit too early um like we had david august and hannah once and people like that back in the day and then it was probably just a bit too early on the cusp before they sort of took off. So, um, yeah, you, you can get it right. You can, you can get it wrong by going a bit too soon. Uh, and kind of transitioning into that, because, you know, Anjuna Deep has their big live events and that's kind of their bread and butter almost right now. Um, but it all starts with the platform of the label and you have your own label, uh, your label called Signs, right? And doing some digging and some of our initial chats, you have done one, maybe two events and then uh, the world kind of shut down and everything, right? Yeah. But let's kind of dive into uh, your label a bit. Why did you want to start the label in the first place? Uh, and and we'll start there and kind of see, kind of see, see where we go. <laughs> So the idea was to uh, was to build it into an event series and a label. Our first show was, I think it was, yeah, it was February 29th because the leap year, 2020. So literally about two weeks before the world shut down. So I didn't time that very well. Yeah, but the original idea was to build uh, an event series and then use it to to release my own stuff between when I had gaps between other labels. So, I mean, for example, with All Day I Dream, some of the stuff takes up to a year, eight months once it's signed to come out because they do one release a month and there's you know there's a queue so that was the idea i mean i do still plan to bring it back a little bit more but that, that was the original idea behind it yeah uh, and t I've always found like taking, running a label, doing all of the, the inner workings that kind of makes, makes the music happen. It takes a lot of time on top of touring, on top of producing and everything like that. Right. So what, what kind of like return on investment are you seeing other than just to have a platform to release the music that isn't getting signed to it, to all day I dream? Yeah. I mean, that's the key part of it. There's very little return on investment from the music side, at least, um, and I don't mean, just... and I don't mean only like financial, right? Because like run, you, running a record label, it it opens up a lot of other doors, uh, you know, in in the industry and for yourself and for your own creativity and stuff like that. So, what benefits do you have of running such a time intensive endeavor? Um, again, I guess the first point is is filling those gaps, um, and I have enough decent sort of networks now that I can release music to and send my stuff through signs to other big artists which is which is a plus um it helps the relationship building as well i mean for example the last release was a collaboration with robbie atbell and so i've released on his label now he's been on mine i've got another remix coming up for him so it can help to, to foster those relationships as well okay uh and what have you learned about the music industry overall having run your label or done done your research and done your digging into starting the label and everything like that that you didn't know before um, the, the financial side of, of just releasing music, I guess, um, and the ins and outs of, of streaming and how that impacts sales and all that kind of stuff. I mean, well, we've never made any money from any of the releases on there yet um, because you've got to pay for graphic designers and um, mastering, all this kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And then you're getting 0 0.0003 of a dollar for each stream. So it's very much... Uh, it's become a shop window rather than, you know, a, a way of making money. Uh, and how do you, how do you help get the music out there other than, uh, you know, streaming and other than, you know, sending it to your friends? Have you thought of any, or have you finessed any sort of creative marketing strategies uh, that have at least worked for you? Or have you just kind of relied on the, the industry staples, the bread and butter of, of music promo? Yeah, kind of used the, the sort of industry people really, um, Used the uh, jukebox for PR, which has been really handy. Mm -hmm. um, she runs that agency I've known for quite a long time. Um, so yeah, a little bit like that, and, and sort of a little bit of social spend here and there. But I mean, I, 
we're three releases in, so I wouldn't say I've cracked it. Just... it totally, totally. Um, so let's kind of transition into talking to talking about your relationship and your your working with Lee Burridge, right? Because it's definitely been monumental uh, with your career path. Um, how did how did Lee's early support of your work uh, kind of help get you to where you're at now? Uh, and how did that relationship start? Yes, I mean it's been essential. Really, I wouldn't be here without without his support. Um, how it started? I mean, I was making some kind of middle of the road tech house for a bit, and I had some releases on uh, Tool Room and like Flash Mob Records, and stuff like that, but only like minor tracks on VAs and stuff like that. And I, I had one track that was a little bit slower, a bit more melodic, and I DM'd it to Lee, and I forgot about it, and then sort of went out of music into advertising stuff and completely just honestly forgot that I'd even sent it to him and then about six months later he came back and said he doesn't check his DMs on SoundCloud he found it he wants to sign it I was like okay that's exciting and cool but I didn't have anything else like it at that time so I went away and sort of started working on some more bits of a similar style and then I, I met him at Fabric and gave him the B-side on a, on a USB and that was kind of the first time that we'd ever met and then, like I said before, I was in Mexico and he was playing there, so I went and saw him. And then just kind of snowballed from that, really. I mean, since then, I've had six releases, I think, on all three labels now. So All Day I Dream, Drive Off, and Tame Tone. And then I was doing the All Day I Stream for him, but we were doing a lockdown. So um, they were the live stream we did every Sunday, which is about a year, I think. And I think the fact that I went and did one of them from, from uh, Studio 338, which is sort of, the London home of the, of the brand, uh, and did did the stream from from the club. Kind of, I thought he uh, appreciated the lads that I'd gone to 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 do that. And then from there, I guess just more shows with him. Um, played in Dubai and London, and did the festival in the States. Um, and then and then the Ibiza series last summer. So, I guess yeah, his support has just made everything snowball for me. And yeah, I definitely wouldn't be here. Uh, yeah, without him, and I guess I mean I I think I make decent music, and I think it's interesting. But a lot of people make good music, right? Mm -hmm. So having someone with a ready-made platform there and who trusts in you enough has been yeah vital for me. Really. Yeah, and it's it's interesting that it all started with like a DM, especially like on SoundCloud, right? Uh, because there's like a general assumption, or it's easy to assume, let's say, that uh, you know, bigger artists don't check their DMs, big labels don't check their demo inboxes, and so there's no real point in in sending them or like you know just sending out cold emails or whatever. But like a lot of my industry friends, you know, myself even included, uh, kind of got their start just by sending cold emails and sending music around, right? Um, so I so think there are our merits to that <laughs> yeah as long as you don't spam people when you do it in a sort of respectful way is, you know because uh, i get a lot i mean i try and answer everything i get but i still get a few that i forget that are slightly more sp spammy they kind of do put me off but if i get a nice message going i like what you do here's what i do i'd love if you had five minutes to listen to it you know that definitely makes a difference i think Totally. And don't, don't just put, put them in a BCC blast. Uh, that's the most obvious red flag, but, but that to that note also, is that like, you know, there's a lot of people who are making good music, but at the same time, I feel like music producers, uh, you know, maybe like Lee Burridge or, you know, producers of that level and stuff like they are passionate about music and they respect good music. So if you send them, if, if you make good music, uh, they'll at least, you'll at least be able to get on their radar. And if you keep sending them good music, keep sending them good music, then eventually some door will open. But um, I feel like I always say this, but like making really dope music is kind of like the table stakes, right? Like once you need to, once you make really fucking good music, then that's when start things start happening. Uh, that's when doors start opening, but um, it just takes six, seven 10 years to get to that point. <laughs> uh, exactly. That that was probably 2018, 2019 that that happens. Mm -hmm. and 35 now. So it's, you know, it's certainly taking a while to get to this point. But yeah, you've got to be patient, I think. Yeah. And Lee Burridge is like a special kind of artist, right? Because he's a phenomenal DJ, but there's also like this, this presence to him, right? Like almost like some musical kind of shaman I've heard people describe him as. Um, what have you, what have you learned? What kind of information or, you know, inspiration have you gleaned from him just by being in the same room and being around his energy and just seeing how he, how he does his thing? Um, 
from a DJing point of view, definitely just to be a bit more free and not plan stuff. Because I used to not plan a whole set, but plan a couple of mixes that I wanted to do and that kind of thing and stuff that I wanted to play on that set because it was coming out soon or whatever. But I think the difference with really these, it just goes all over the place and, and it's dictated by what is getting back from the crowd. So I think that's that's a key part of it. But I mean, I guess from an industry point of view, being being around him at the um, uh, in Ibiza for the summer, not an awful lot that I didn't already know. But I mean, I guess it's a small industry, right? And if someone fucks up, then people talk about it. So hearing him talk to management and stuff like that about that kind of thing, that was quite interesting. Um, and then just I guess in hearing. The ins and outs of the festival that he was running at the time and, and see who they booked and why and that kind of stuff. Yeah. Yeah, you definitely pick up bits. Um that's actually actually a good question or a good good note. And without naming names or anything like that, obviously, but like what goes into who who they book and why? Um, I, I guess a lot of it is just the music that Lee enjoys. I mean, that's how old Air Dream got to that point, right? Just signing stuff he loves. So um I don't think there's anything more in it than that, really. Oh, interesting. Okay, so there's no there's no hidden voodoo or anything or strategic planning or yeah, anything? It's, it's not like, oh, we're going to book this guy because he's got lots of fans here or this girl because... Because we, we can get him for cheap. Yeah, it's, <laughs> anyway, just for a, for a love of music. Um, so what, I mean, let, what else is it like being a part of a summer residency in, in Ibiza, right? Like, especially for this kind of music that you're involved in, uh, that's kind of like the, the capstone Mecca of, of where you can be playing your music. So what, what's it like? Um, last summer was the first time I've, I've played in that in Ibiza for the last sort of 10 or 15 years, but only flown in and blown out. So last year was the first time that I, uh, I lived there permanently and, um, it's just a special place. Just, just exploring the rest of the island, not just the clubs, but the whole island itself is is um is special. Um, I guess from a, from a musical point of view, playing regularly because I was playing maybe once once a month before that, two shows a month, and going from that to playing regularly definitely sort of improved my confidence in my mixing, what kind of stuff works, what doesn't. Um, so yeah, it was uh, definitely a good experience. And I want to kind of segue back into like you yourself as an artist. And the segue question I'm going to ask is, is all day I dream labels like all day I dream and Juna stuff like that. They all have like this super sonic identity, right? That like people attach as much to the brand and the sonic sonics of the brand as they do to the artist releasing on the label. Um, and you don't ever really want to like pigeon yourself, hold, pigeon hold yourself into that brand. Right. So how do you kind of separate your own artistic identity from labels who have such a, a core identity, like all day I dream. That is a tricky one. Cause I guess that's something I'm trying to pivot on at the moment is so that people do go, oh, you can play a bit heavier or you can play a bit minimal here or a bit dubby or whatever, you know. Um, so I guess DJing-wise, I'm playing a lot more varied sets now, probably a lot heavier than when I started. Um, and uh, musically, I guess I'm sending I'm sending stuff to a wider range of labels and I'm kind of waiting to hear back from a few people. So, yeah, I'm working on it at the moment. How long is a usual time to to wait on sending a, a label a demo to a label uh, before you send it to other labels? Because um, you waited for a, you know you didn't really wait, but you sent Lee a demo and then you didn't hear back for months or up to a year. Uh, but I know other producers kind of get patient and like the industry standard for follow ups and stuff is like wait two weeks and if you haven't heard back, then blah blah blah. Right. So where's the fine line or where's the where's the middle ground? I usually give it a couple of weeks before moving on some people are better than uh, coming back than others um but it definitely helps if someone gives you a no rather than just doesn't listen at all because that can be quite frustrating i know i know people are busy but i'd rather get a a flat no with no explanation why than a are they listening to it Getting getting ghosted. Um, yeah. So you've been in the industry for a, for a very very long time, right? Between your internships and you know your time just doing the mark marketing stuff, the agency, and blah 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 blah. And I'm sure you've bumped shoulders with a with countless numbers of industry people, right? How do you approach like networking? How do you build relationships and stuff like that without having it feel too much like a job, or even though it is. Um, I guess. 
I mean, for me, apart from, I guess, the, the thing with Lee and the USB and whatever, it's, it's happened fairly naturally because of the job that I was in. Um, so I haven't really found myself going out of my way to create these relationships. They've kind of happened naturally. And and now even more so the fact that I'm sort of playing somewhere else every week and meeting, meeting new people. Um, uh- I think people can see if you're kind of just there trying to find out information from them or trying to get something away with them that kind of stuff it, it definitely comes through and how do you because meeting people is one thing and then like kind of keeping in their orbit is a whole nother thing right how do you how, do you have any advice on like you know staying in contact with with people other than just like saying on whatsapp hey man what's up <laughs> um I, think, I mean seeing people in person is always the best way mm-hmm. um, uh yeah it's not really because you're you're in a lucky spot because you're you're out and about a lot more, right? You're out in the wild yeah. touring and stuff like that, right? Um, but I know a lot of the, the a lot of the listeners and a lot of the producer community is kind of s- still stuck at home. They're probably still at that bedroom community or bedroom producer type of type of stage. Um, do you have do you have any advice or any kind of insights, uh, even if you're not quite involved in the bedroom producer community? Yeah, I guess it's just getting out and meeting people. And if you don't have the opportunity to to meet people that you want to, then create it, right? So start your own label start your own brand um event event series that kind of stuff and build it and they will come i guess type like yeah, yeah and i we kind of touched upon this a little bit earlier but um you know there's there's a general assumption that you know to to get anything going or get anything off the ground in the music industry right you need a ton of money or you need a ton of connections or you need this 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 and this before you can start making things happen right but i mean It sounds like from your experience and, you know, from what I've encountered in the industry and stuff, it's, I think getting going is the most important thing, right? So do you have any advice on like, you know, would be DJs, up and coming producers who maybe they just moved to a city like London and they want to start getting their foot in the door or starting to make their own thing happen or whatever. Do you have any advice to them from your own experience or seeing what's worked for other uh, of your friend producers, friend promoters, stuff like that? Yeah. I mean, I mean, for me, the, um, the internship I did was the, the the foot in the door, really. So I'd advise anyone doing that, even if it's, I mean, I don't know how paid, how often paid these things are now compared to what they used to be, but that, that was the end for me. And then I guess, yeah, the DIY element of it, starting labels, parties, building stuff from scratch, you know, as well as the same time trying to forge those relationships with, I guess, the gatekeepers, if you like. Um, and then I guess from an artist, point of view is just sort of I guess trying to stay original and and in it for the right reasons and not trying to copy other people and you know that kind of that kind of thing uh do you think it's any harder for up-and-coming newer producers artists promoters to kind of get their foot in the door get something started now than it was what you about a decade ago is when you started maybe a little bit even uh even later than that do you think it's harder do you how do you think the industry's changed and how do you think it's stayed the same uh, I think there's a lot more music out there than there was when I started. Like, um, I don't know if the event side has, has changed as much. I guess there's a lot of bigger one-off shows going on. Like stuff in London, you've got Printworks, which is taking up sort of 5,000 people every weekend. So there seems to be a lot more large-scale parties going on than there was you know, before, and that takes everyone out of the smaller sort of DIY venues and that kind of stuff. Um, yeah. Um, and what are the what are the bigger acts coming through Printworks, right? Like brands like Afterlife are coming in, and Juna stuff like that. Um, are there what other type of big parties are able to sell that out? And is it all the parties that are having that big of of success? Are they all just big label parties, or can more promoter specific groups? sell out parties like that they tend to be either really established promoters who've been going for 15 20 years and then there'd be like crank brothers and stuff like that or it tends to be labels and brands from abroad so ants and music cards and stuff like that and that that takes people out of the smaller venues and i, I felt like there's a lot smaller venues closing down um than there was when i was involved in it 
Show. Yeah, because it's it it almost seems like I mean I'm I'm not saying that the music is 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 this or anything, but like it's almost like when a Walmart comes into town and shuts out all of the other mom and pop stores uh in the entire town, right? It's just like these massive commercial, even if the music doesn't sound commercial, the like the whole approach and the industry approach to it all seems pretty big commercial because there's so much money on the line when you can pack five thousand people into a room that um it it it's undeniable, I guess, but I guess that's just kind of where the music industry is 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 at. Um, but you also talked about a lot of music out there, right? There and there's more competition to a certain degree. But I have a hot take about this: is that like there's a lot of lot of people making music, right? Tons. You can pirate a copy of Ableton, pirate a couple drum loops, and boom, you have a track that you potentially could send to a label. Not that you should, because you just threw a couple loops together, right? So there's a lot of noise out there, but there's but the, but the the amount of people who have been chasing their dream for an eight years, a decade, or however long it takes to make music that's really fucking good, as we had talked about before, um, those are a rare breed. I feel like. Um, so I don't know. I don't even know if I had a question at the end of this. I just had a hot take. <laughs> well, it makes sense. I mean, I uh, always was under the impression that I needed a fallback and a career thing to go alongside it. Um, it's only until recently that I've been doing it full time. So I think that's a key part of it. Don't just expect to make it because there is so much competition and mm -hmm. you spend so much time working on one thing that doesn't happen, then you leave yourself kind of really sure. Well, you had the you had the luxury, and again, you were probably one of the the lucky ones where you had some of that freelance work, right? So that kind of hopefully maybe gave you the flexibility to yeah. make that transition from from you know normal nine to five i do that in air quotes into uh into the artist thing while still having that buffer of, of freelance work um yeah. but but so that definitely helps but in terms of like you know setbacks and stuff because you know you you had your first big break with lee five years ago it was 2023 now and it was 2018 right i'm sure that there were a lot of hurdles a lot of road bumps and a lot of setbacks uh that you had to weather and go through leading up to that point right um how do you kind of keep your head up and handle those disappointments when it, they seem like they're unending for a decade before fun stuff starts happening? Um, I think you've got to have a thick skin and be able to handle rejection. Um, for sure. I mean, just don't take rejections personally. If you think, I mean, I still send stuff to Lee that he doesn't sign and I was like, okay, well, that's fine. I'm not going to take it personally and, you know, get upset about it. Like, someone else might like it. So I think, yeah, having a thick skin and not taking rejection person is probably the, the key side of it. Any, uh, any, oh, oh, so I didn't mean to interrupt. Yeah, I guess talking to people in the industry and outside of the industry when you do have setbacks to get sort of a wider view on the situation helps. Um, I've been going through some sort of legal stuff recently that I've had to speak to lots of different people about um, and it helps getting different perspectives on that kind of stuff. So. Um, totally. And I mean, you, you, you had mentioned it earlier, but like, you know, you, you mentioned that one line about being in it for the right reasons. Right. And I think one of the, the, the most right, the rightest reasons, uh, is to like it for the process and not for the end result. Right. If you start making, if you start throwing loops together in Ableton with the main dream of I'm going to headline Ibiza with Lee Burridge, um, those, those disappointments and those rejections and everything are going to hit a lot harder than if you just love making music or you in love with the process and all the benefits and all the setbacks are just a part of that process. Um, it's, they're a lot easier to kind of roll with the punches I found. Yeah. hundred percent. Um, so, uh, kind of moving on to the more, uh, production side of things. Uh, but you had a somewhat of a formal education at like a brick and mortar production school or or college or university or whatever um and while i don't think that school is still in operation right but like how were how was that investment into your own career and your own artistic side of your career um how did that kind of pay off and how did that shape your sound and who you are today yeah um so i i did um evening classes so i did every wednesday night for about a year at a place called ssr in camden uh yeah is is isn't there anymore but I was in as I said before I was in a duo for a bit and I was kind of the industry side of it so I was getting sort of gigs and the other guy I was making on the music and um I'd sort of sit next to him and go try this try that but I didn't really know how to explain it or how to 
get anything done I'm talking about. So I guess it was born out of frustration and necessity at that point that I needed to do something about it. Um, yes, yeah, so it was a bricks and mortar place, as you said. Um, uh, there was, I think, eight of us in the group, and it was um, it was all live. So the guy called G- Gio Cipiano was my uh, tutor, and he was incredible, really, really good. By the end of it, I think there was only five of us left, so we got a lot more time of his time than, than we did at the beginning. Um, I guess I'd been messing about with logic for a while and had lots of nice ideas, but was spending hours and hours on YouTube tutorials trying to work out how to do stuff. And that cut all that time, all that learning time down massively. So if someone over your shoulder saying, you tried this instead of trying to Google the answer to something is, you know, cuts all that time down. Um, and I think the key part, is just, I mean, just even keyboard shortcuts. So if you've got something in your head, you don't quite know how to get it down. You know, it speeds up that process as well. So getting those ideas out of your head onto paper if you like. Um, and then I guess another part of the course was like composition for electronic music as well. So it wasn't just how to use the software, it was how to make interesting music. So yeah, that was um, that was the game changer for me, for sure. Yeah, I was actually writing an article about this uh, just yesterday. So I've, I was have some it's on my mind, but like, what, what do you think a bit? So a big thing on like Reddit and all of these like internet forum producer flex forums and stuff. Is that like, why put money into anything when you can find everything on YouTube? Right. So let's take that as one end of the spectrum. And then the other end of the spectrum is actually investing in, in some sort of coursework or some sort of, you know, credible masterclass, right? Like that, like, what are the benefits of, of that? You already mentioned that like having that direct mentorship uh, is, is really good that be able to bounce ideas directly off of someone and answer those questions. Uh, can you talk about the, the merits of that and like the, the return on your investment, I guess you could say. Yeah. I mean, at the time, I think I, I think I only paid like 500 pounds mm-hmm. for each courses so for each six months. It was three hours a night, every Wednesday, pretty much. Um, yeah. I, oh. The, um, yeah, as I said before, the, the key part of it is just cutting down that time of where you feel like you're floundering and you don't really have any direction. Um, you know, you can spend ages watching YouTube t- tutorials, but it might you might watch five of those before you actually get to one that's answering your question, if you like. So, yeah, it's, it's, the time saving um, is definitely the major part. And I think a lot of the time uh, it's very easy to uh watch youtube and and think that you're like learning stuff but it's kind of just like infotainment right you feel like you're working but you're not actually like letting anything sink in and most importantly you're not actually working on music uh where a lot of the times working either maybe like on with a one-on-one with a producer that you respect or going to these education like brick and mortar schools or these formal educations like you practice music by working on music, right? Which is the most important thing. Um, and you're not like kind of wasting time. You're actually like working on building a track with these instructors, with your mentors and stuff like that. Yeah. You're learning while doing as opposed to learning, yeah. watching. Which is, yeah. <laughs> totally. Um, and what I was kind of, the article that I was writing uh, yesterday was it talk, it was talking about making the argument that like the the merits of you know formal educations mentorships whatever it costs one on one sessions whatever um how important they are because like what it takes to get started is way different than what it might take to like go from beginner to amateur or amateur to pro right it's when you're never started you just opened up Ableton for the first time YouTube might be great because there's a one on one tutorial on how to use Ableton right but like you get to a certain point where you've learned all that shit and then you've learned everything that YouTube has to offer uh, with sound design or whatever, but there's still a ton of shit that you don't know and you continue throwing paint at the wall and that's where it gets most dangerous, right? Because you throw paint at the wall looking for that one little bit of of thing that's holding you back uh, and you could get so frustrated you end up burning out if that goes on for a year just because you didn't learn that one two three things when that's where the merits of having like a mentor or going to a school like what you did uh has you know it's like it it's exactly what you need it fills in those exact gaps anyway it's my long-winded answer reply <laughs> um so how do you how do you maintain such a uh diverse kind of sound while all still sounding like you how do you kind of continue to push the boundaries for yourself while staying true to your own sonic identity sonic brand um i guess i mean my personal my my sound is evolving from track to track you know the more i learn the the more the wider arsenal of stuff i can use 
But um, I mean, I began by this was another note from Geo from my Tuesday was saying you don't need loads and loads of software and hardware to be able to to make a good track. You just need to find some things that you enjoy using and learn them inside out. So, I mean, for the first three or four years of producing, I've just been using the logic stuff, the, the in the box stuff. I mean, there's a reason why they bought Alchemy out. Is, is, is because it's a really powerful synth and they wanted to put it in bloody for everyone. So that stuff is powerful and it's there for a reason. So he was like, learn that inside out, then get a few of the bits that you need and that, that you enjoy using, like you might like the interface or something. And just stick to those. Don't spend, don't waste time learning how to use lots of different things. Um, so that, that was a key part of it. So I still I still use a lot of the same, the same sort of plugins and sounds and stuff like that. Um, and more recently, I guess, the sound has changed as a, as a result of circumstance. So I was in a, a studio in London in my house for years and years. And more recently, because I've been moving around so much, I don't have my mics and my percussion stuff. And I don't do as much live because I'm on a friend's kitchen table like I am now with the little MIDI keyboard. And, and then I might be off somewhere else for the next week. So, um, so that's that's kind of, yeah, the circumstances have, have resulted in a bit of change for that. Um, yeah, I guess that's it. Yeah. And I mean, to double down on what you're talking about, of like, you know, just kind of picking your, your toolkit, your arsenal of, of stuff and just learning them really well. Um, I feel like that also kind of plays into, uh, you know, what is your sound as an artist, right? Like, cause every artist kind of, at, especially once they are really good at their craft, like they have a certain like texture to their music, a certain type of like vibe to their music, um, that, is consistent, even if the tracks are wildly different. Right. And I think a lot of it comes down to the fact that like they've, they found that they're using the same five cents on every track, right. They're using the same collection of maybe a hundred different drum hits, you know, one single kick they use in every track, you know, a handful of different snares, claps, hats, blah, blah, blah. So that like that they've curated and over, over a decade of, of work, they know it works for them. Uh, and now when they're releasing music, they're all using the same kind of stuff, just in different ways. And that kind of makes their sounds sound like them. Um, what are, so on that note, like outside of the logic stuff, and if it's just strictly logic stuff, that's a perfectly fine answer. But like, what, what are there some fun plugins that you find yourself always returning to? Um, I, I use all the UVI stuff they put out. I'm a sucker for, so I use the like, world suite, um, the orchestral suite for strings and stuff like that. Um, Quadra Traveler, which is kind of a new one, which is kind of, uh, uh, I guess, mixes live instruments with, you know, preset synths and stuff like that, which is kind of cool. Um, and then like PX Memories I use quite a lot. So you'll notice a lot of the sounds in mine, especially that last EP on All Day I Dream, and from using those. Um, so yeah, I'm a sucker for whenever I get an email with, from them with a new thing. That's the first one because I'm just, you know, like I said before, got to got to know the interface and you know trust that whatever they put out is going to be good. Um, a lot of logic stuff I mentioned, like alchemy and just the quick sample of getting stuff done quickly, and you know the retro synth and stuff like that. Um, and then just a contact and massive, but I guess it's all, yeah. You know, I don't really uh, deviate outside of that too much. Um, I've got, as you say, I've got a bank of drums saved up that I've been using for five, five, six years that I'm happy with, and I don't sort of deviate outside of that, so that you know that retains my sound. And then the, I guess in in terms of hardware, not an awful lot. I've got a, an old Apogee audio interface and um, like an AKG compressor mic because I grew up playing the drums, so I play a lot of percussion and drums and stuff like that in through that. Um, and then a few sort of little Korg outboard units like the bulk of bass and stuff like that just for messing about on um but that's it really yeah fairly fairly simple yeah and like in the same way that you talked about you know learning the key commands uh back in back in the university and stuff right as a way to fluidly get the ideas out of your head into your DAW like have keeping keeping your setup minimal uh is exactly exactly the same too right you don't need to worry about do i use synth xyz uh one two three four five six or seven you have like okay is this a synth one job synth two job or synth three job okay two boom let's go and it just like you know it's it it, it saves so much time not having to decide what synth to use and then when you've decided it what what needs to be done to get the sound uh, that you want um so you know i'm sure you're working on a ton of music uh you have probably a handful laundry list of different works and project pro progress and stuff like that um 
How do you how do you go about like asking your producer friends, industry connections for feedback? And then how do you remain like objective about their feedback? Um I guess that's what we were going back to earlier about people not sort of taking stuff personally is a key part of it. I mean, especially when you're collaborating with people. But I mean, I've I've good friends like Fluida, for example, Graham's a good friend of mine, so I send a lot of stuff to him. Um, Eduardo McGregor, who I've made music with before, Tim Green sometimes sends stuff to him. So even my mum, she's a musician, I ask her if she likes this kind of stuff. So yeah, it's nice to get other ears on it. Um, and I'm I'm never too precious about anything that someone doesn't like. I'll happily just take it out and try something out. Um, and when you send songs to to producers for feedback, um, what kind of questions are you asking them? Or do you just ask them like, what do you think of this one? Or do you ask them specific questions like, what do you think of the kick? How do you think the lead is? What do you think the transitions are like? Is it is it granular questions like that? Or is it mostly just like, hey, Tim Green, check out this song? Yeah, it's much broader than that. It's just like, what do you think of this? Is it missing something? Mm -hmm. where, do you, where do you go next with it? That kind of thing. Uh, and how how many how many people do you think you end up sending a song out to? Is there a, a core group of like five? Or do you send it out to yeah. anyone who will yeah. listen and then only a couple will get back to you? Sometimes I don't send them out at all, really. Just occasionally, if I'm struggling with something, if something's flowing and coming together quickly, then I won't, I won't send it to anyone. But it's, a, it's, it's more if I'm struggling with something or if I'm playing something out and road testing it, and it's like, this isn't quite hitting where it should. And that kind of... Um, and how far into the creative process uh, and the songwriting and the production side of things do you normally have a song before you start like road testing it um, at your gigs? Because you have the luxury of performing way more frequently than I'm sure many other producers do. Yeah, I usually have stuff 95% done. And it's only really tweaks after that. Um, and so you talked about, uh, you know, how you worked in a duo, but then you also have your solo project and stuff like that. Um, how do you manage, uh, working not only on working on your solo project artist or art, solo artist project stuff, and then also like collaborations and stuff and, and, and working with other artists. Uh, I'm trying to do less collaborations moving forward because I've done quite a few in the last sort of couple of years. Um, but I genuinely love the process of it much more though, more so than, um, than remixing. I find remixing is a bit stifling sometimes because you get these parts. You have to kind of stay true to the original a little bit before, you know, as well as putting your own spin on it. I find that kind of puts you in a bit of a bit of a box. But then with the collaborating with people, it's a lot more fluid, like take that out. I don't like this. That's not working. We can try lots of other stuff. There's more back and forth. I mean, for example, I did a, a, an EP with Ramo, a French guy, and he's a like multi-instrumentalist like he sent me about 65 70 parts of guitars drums little hits and ad-libs and stuff like that i think i ended up using maybe eight or nine of them in one track and you know and then going back to him and him sending stuff back but i guess it's different with with different people um like hope that was just on my last ep with fluida they sent me a finished track and I went into that and sucked some stuff out of it and added some stuff in and then turned it back to Graham and then he did some more stuff. So that was kind of a different different approach. But yeah, I enjoy that. I enjoy that kind of that process a lot more than, than remixing. But I guess in, in terms of balancing that out, I think yeah, moving forward I'm, I'm sort of focusing on less releases but a bit better quality and um and kind of doing more of my own my own stuff. When you say less releases, how many is the ideal amount for you know air quote less releases in a year but higher quality i think maybe four a year or four full EPs a year maybe or five um because i mean there was points where i might have two remixes out in the same month and i think it's just yeah i guess just filling that content gap but if you like um so now i'm just trying to make less better music yeah, because I think kind of, you know, that's a good kind of culmination of of all that we've kind of touched on and chatted about is that like there's this general assumption or like this 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 biting hunger to feed the algorithm, right? Where you just need to constantly like, holy shit, I haven't had a song in release in three weeks and I don't have anything next month. Let me put together this crappy bootleg and throw it out there or I need a release. OK, let's just this label sucks, but they'll sign it and then send it off when really like, you know, to cut through the noise uh, and, and, you know, make more of a lasting career and actually have people like 
notice you and, and, you know, say, Oh, you know, this producer actually means business. It's a much better strategic approach. I think just to yeah. make good, good music less frequently and really like sink your teeth into music you believe in. Yeah. I mean, a couple of years ago, I would have been taking everything, every remix I could just for the opportunity and that kind of stuff. But as I sort of progress, I'm trying to, yeah, go back to the less is more kind of approach, I guess. Well, especially with like your own original music, like I feel like remixes, as we, or as you just said, like remixes are a little bit slightly different because it's, it's even even when you release it, your name isn't at the front of the release. Um, so it, those those are a completely different approach than releasing your own music that is, you know, so and so's original original track. You really want those to like kind of stand the test of time. Um, but outside of outside of that, do you have any other advice uh, for kind of up and coming producers or producers that are like super talented amateurs who are like, my music is good. Why am I not getting noticed by Lee Burridge? <laughs> Um, I guess try and keep it original is the first, the first thing I, I get lots of sound alike. So, so I obviously have got signs as well, but I help out with music to loom and I help them with some of the A&R and we get a lot of stuff and I try and feedback on everything, you know, so it helps people when they're moving forward. But a lot of the time I get really nicely produced stuff that might sound like something else you've heard already, really nicely mixed, but I'm going, what am I walking away? Can I remember the melody as soon as it's finished can I can I hum what I've just been listening to does mm -hmm. it stick out so that's I guess that like it's the what's the takeaway from the track that I'm remembering as opposed to just being a nice collage of sounds essentially um and then I guess another part of that is like evolution of tracks as they go maybe you don't need that so much in like tech house or techno or whatever but in melodic stuff if you've got exactly the same stuff happening after the second break that you've had in the middle section then there's no extra, um, I guess, take away from that track. So it's like, if you've got a melody that goes all the way through it, how can you tease that in instead of just dropping the whole thing in all the way through? Um, maybe you can do a sort of call and response thing and then bring the whole thing in after the second half. So it's kind of evolution of sounds and parts from one part of the track to another, which is a, a thing I, I find missing quite a lot. Yeah, I mean, because that that all comes down to like the the actual songwriting of the track, right? It's not just the production side of it, because like you can be a really talented mix engineer and make a pad and some texture and some drums be playable in the club that will be certainly be like danceable and people won't think twice about it. But like they'll forget it the second they the track's over, right? So by that melody, even if the song isn't mixed to perfection, uh, the melody will stay with them regardless if the melody's good. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Um, so yeah, kind of as we begin to wind down this conversation and stuff like that, let's kind of talk about looking forward. Um, so what, what are your long-term goals as an artist, uh, as a producer, kind of label owner? What's your, what's your five-year, 10-year, uh, projection for yourself? Um, I just want to do this full-time for the rest of my career, really. So that's, that's the plan at the moment is steadily building, improving on what, I've, what I've done before. Um, yeah, and just kind of keep doing it for as long as I possibly can and be comfortable with it. Um, with size, the, the plan is to, to to build that into an events brand and use some of my experience for the last sort of ten years and building that and bringing that back. And so I've got a few conversations starting with people at the moment to 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 start that back up. Um, but I guess that's it, really. Yeah, the main thing is just to keep going for as long as possible. <laughs> um, and so, what are some? What are some like things that you do every single day other than just like work that continue to chip away at that goal? I think a lot of producers uh, kind of wake up and they're like, all right, I'm going to make music today. And that's all they do to help build up their career. And while that is certainly, certainly important, like you got to make really fucking good music. That's table stakes, as we said before. Um, but there's a whole bunch of other little tasks, right? You can do, you know send out emails, send out demos for 10 minutes a day, do this for 10 minutes a day, work on a radio show to get your brand out there. Like what are, what are some things you can just habitually chip away at that, that will build over time? I mean, I have loads and loads of to-do lists of various things. I mean, I haven't got agents for each part of the world. So I've got shows coming up in Australia and Bali in a couple of weeks that have been organized myself through friends of friends and that kind of stuff. So I might, portion part of the day into reaching out to promoters then I might do okay I need to send I've got a hit list of labels that I want to send music to so I might work through them and then you know 
got my PR stuff to do, mixes and that. So, yeah, I, I try and sort of portion my day down into those different things. I find it personally that I really struggle making music when it's daylight. I, I always have to wait for it to be dark and everyone to have gone to bed and be no distractions before I sort of do my best work. So I try and do all the daytime stuff, all the sort of day-to-day tasks first, get them out of the way and then, yeah, set myself away. And um, how much of your to-do list do you allot to like handling your social media and like engaging with fans on social media? Because I feel like there, it's certainly important. It's if not like a vital step of the process, but there is diminishing returns after a certain amount of time and you are just going to, you know, waste time on it. And it's easy to yeah. waste time after a while. I kind of do all that on the fly, really. I should probably have a bit more of a, of a content plan and stuff like that. But I, yeah, I guess I, yeah, I don't really have much of a strategy for that. <laughs> it's not why I'm in this job at all and kind of find it a bit of a drag, to be honest. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's part, of the, part of the game where you have to do it. Yeah, that's what literally every single person that I talk to, especially like the full time musicians and full time producers and stuff like that, is that it's like it's the worst part of their job that they hate doing, but you just have yeah. to do it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So you're not going to see me doing any videos to camera anytime soon. So yeah, I should probably put a bit more effort into it. Yeah, yeah, but it's 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 an uphill battle, the one that does not come naturally to most producers who'd rather be just making tunes in their studio. Um, but you know, speaking of coming up, my final question um is what do you have coming up? Anything that you really want to hype up other than your Ibiza residency with All Day I Dream? Yeah, um there's quite a lot going on. The first gigs in Australia and Bali next week, yeah, fly out next Friday, so that'd be cool. Uh and then back for All Day I Dream, yeah, for summer in Ibiza and then a show in Mykonos. Um, I'm potentially working on a radio show for Ibiza Global Radio, which I'm going to be doing once a month. And then I've got some remixes for Robbie Akbar and another one from my friend Yanni um, that's going to come out soon. Um, I've got a mix for Electronic Groove to do. This is on my to-do list. Uh, and then just loads of other music that I finished sort of first half of the year that, um, that I need to send out, really. Oh, and uh, Burning Man. I'm going to the first Burning Man uh, this summer as well, so that would be good. And you've never been? I've never been. Special. Um, are you having gigs lined up, or are you just going to take everything with the flow? I've never been. It sounds super fun, and I wouldn't be surprised if I end up there eventually, but I haven't been as of now. I've got a couple lined up, yeah. Uh, one with Celtic Chaos, who were uh, a lovely bunch of Irish lads that I did a uh, fundraiser for in San Francisco the other week, so um, yeah, that was the main one, but I guess more will come up as uh, as we get closer. That's super exciting, man. I'm excited for you. Uh, and the last question, the last final, final question, is there anything that I should have asked you that I didn't? Any touch points uh, that we could have touched upon or any hot takes that didn't get said that you want to leave on the table before we part ways? I don't know. I think, I think we covered most of it. <laughs> awesome. Well, I appreciate your time, man. Thanks for coming on the podcast and um, we'll keep in touch for sure. Awesome. Thanks, Will. Yeah. Have a great weekend, man. Cheers. Bye. Bye.